All right, so these are my beautiful slides right here. No? How many people are excited for this session? Awesome. How many people are excited about APIs? How many people love audience participation? One, perfect. So very quickly about me, the reason I do this presentation is, is not because I want to like, impart some great wisdom, but I consider myself an API fanatic. And what that means is I've had the privilege to build APIs and use APIs, and that means I've built some APIs that I'm not very proud of, and I've also used APIs that have broken on me. How many people here have used an API that has broken? Just a few people. So the whole point of this presentation is, how do you build an API that's not going to break and isn't going to make a bunch of people angry? And I know what you're thinking. Wait, what's the cat's name? The cat is Felix. So that's all I have. So if you think about it today, APIs are changing the world. I think we'd all agree on that. Uh, in fact, there are over 17,000 public APIs. Last year, that number was 15,000. The year before, that number was 13,000 from programmable web. But the real interesting thing about that is that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you look at that, we have 17,000 public APIs. We have so many more private APIs, internal APIs, enterprise APIs, APIs connecting to mobile apps, watches, et cetera. In fact, today, APIs are connecting things like phones, watches, glasses, cars. If you think about that, uh, they now have APIs for your cars so where someone could actually hack the API and hit the brakes on your car. They're connecting refrigerators. When I was at Samsung's conference a couple years ago, uh, they had a refrigerator that would tell you what the weather was like outside, what sales were out there, thermostats, in-home robots. Uh, if you look outside, we got Pepper out here, and a lot more. And I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to think about all that means and how much is required for these APIs to work so that IoT can remain persistent. I want you to imagine walking home one day, and you're at home, and you're, you're cooking, and you're having a great time, and all of a sudden, someone smashes the window, and your burglar alarm goes off. You know, wee, wee, wee. I don't know. I think that's what burglar alarms sound like. And you're thinking, you know what? This is good. You know, the police are going to be on their way. Everything's fine. And all of a sudden, you hear, wee, wee, wee. Update required. If we don't keep our APIs persistent, things start working. The other problem with that is versioning and making changes is expensive. But it's not just expensive for you building that API, it's expensive for everyone. It's expensive for all your consumers that are trying to use the API and not refactor all of their code. Thankfully, I'm gonna try my best Billy Mays impression here, with five simple steps, you can build an API that's designed to last. They are, first and foremost, go with a long-term mindset. Secondly, understand what it is that you're building and why you're building it. Utilize something called spec-driven development, which we'll talk about. Incorporate best practices, and then repeat steps one through four. So think long-term. How many Warriors fans do we have here? A few people, OK. Well, uh, imagine if, hypothetically, last year, game seven against the Cavaliers, the Warriors are in the tunnel, and they're getting ready to run out, and they're going, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. What do you think would happen in that game? Chances aren't they ain't going to win. Same thing with building an API. If you build an API and say, you know what, let's build this API, let's get out there, and you know, in six months to a year, we're going to replace it, that API is not going to last very long. Also understand that your API is a contract. It's your word to your developers. Versioning is not actually a solution. It creates significant and more problems. Understand that you suck at design. How many people think they're really good at design? Okay, a couple people. How many engineers do we have in the room? Okay, I'm gonna prove to you guys in 30 seconds we're all horrible, horrible at design. How many engineers have written code? Three of them. Okay, here we go. How many people have written code and you look at it and you go, hey, this is an awesome application, this is super cool, I'm really proud of it, this is like the best code ever. Well, yeah, yeah, we've all done that. You're like, yes. And then we get code reviews. How many people have written an application like, this is the best thing ever, it's so amazing, and then you look at it a year later, and you still think, this is the best thing ever. 
How many people have been working with a class and you extend the class and you extend the class and you're thinking, this is amazing, I've extended the class, it's perfect. You extend it again, it does exactly what you need. You extend it again, you're like, I am the best programmer in the world. And you extend it one more time and all of a sudden you have to refactor everything all the way back to the parent class. Because we're very good at focusing on the now, but we're really bad at long-term design. And much like security, you can pay more now or you can pay much, much more later. So think through, uh, think through everything. And of course, mine says everything. When we say your API is a contract, again, it's your word to your users, to your developers. Users who are not only saying, look, I'm going to use this API to build something cool, but are actually focusing on making money for their company. And that means when you change your API, when you break that word, they have to stop building features for their customers and go back and fix the things that you broke. They have to stop saying, hey, this is great. We can add a brand new SMS text messaging system on top of this to hey, our connection to a famous social site's not working, we have to fix that so people can log in so we actually have customers. This means that you also have to think through every aspect of your API before building it. Build things like, uh, who is your API for? What type of API are you building? How are you going to maintain your API? So people say, well, we'll just you know, create the API, we'll deploy it, and it's magically going to take care of itself. It doesn't work that way. How are you going to document your API? How are users going to interact with your API? What about little things like authentication, provisioning, throttling, you know, basic security? How are you going to protect your servers against attacks or DDoSs? And how are you going to manage support? And these don't all have to be really complex answers. For support, it could be something as simple as saying, well, we're not going to provide support. Good luck with that. Or we'll have a dedicated API support team, or engineers will do the support. Or we'll have a community forum and they'll support themselves. But you have to address each one of these things before you even begin to build the API. Also, who will be using your API? Why are you actually building the API? Who are your end users? Are you building it for current customers, business partners? Uh, are you trying to build a platform to get third-party developers? What actions do they need access to? And how can they be involved in the design process from day one? So we think about it, why are you building the API? And when we talk with enterprises, I've, I've had a chance to talk with a bunch, and they say, yes, we're going to build this awesome API to expose our data. That's not enough information. How are they going to use your data? What other services does that need to interact with? Are they going to be using multiple APIs or just one? Uh, what actions do they need to, be able to do with the API? Do they need to, be able to create a user, edit a user? And this is for all of us engineers out here. Do only what is necessary and don't get fancy. Your API is kind of like building a house. You want to build the foundation, and it's not that fancy, but now you can build on top of that and on top of that again. So listing out the actions, one of the easiest ways I've seen to do this is to create a simple chart where you can say, OK, we're going to have users. And for users, they need to be able to create a user, edit a user, retrieve username. Nice and simple. Same thing for messages, send a message, create a draft, send a draft, etc. But by doing this, we've already done several different things. The first thing we've done is we've created our resources. We now know, well, we have a user's resource. We have a messages resource, a procs resource. We've also begun planning where the actions or methods need to go within these resources. For example, I have under users, message user, under messages, send a message. It probably doesn't make sense to have message capability in both users and messages. And I can look at that and say, wow, I can just put messages under messages, and it can stay there. And lastly, how many people have heard something called hypermedia? We've actually identified our hypermedia links. Because we can say, for users, chances are they want to actually message a user, which lets us know that we can use that hypermedia link down in the future for having to go back later and recreate that map. Also, what type of API are you building? Are you building a REST API, a partial REST API, a SOAP API, a uh, remote procedure-based API? Why are you building the API in that format? And th this seems kind of silly, but a lot of times what happens is people say, I'm going to build this REST API. It's going to be awesome. And then you go out halfway through, and they say, you know what? Actually, I really don't like the way that REST you know, uses put and patch. So we're actually just going to change this. Or I really don't want to do a post for this. I just want to do a post with a query string. So understand why you're building the API in that format to prevent those problems. Also understand what's it mean for development, what's it mean for usability, and what's it mean for the longevity of your API? For example, if we look at the three major types, SOAP APIs, RPC, and REST, with SOAP, the great thing here is that it could be stateful or stateless. 
If you need long transactions that can have rollback capabilities, it's perfect for that. Uh, WSDL is actually really great. You do a simple call to WSDL, you get the definitions, really nice. On the other hand, larger packets of data, not the easiest to use, requires a SOAP library. Well, RPC. RPC is the easiest one for developers to use. In fact, we see a lot of hybrids of RPC, and we've seen very successful RPC APIs such as MailChimp. The downside, it usually is very tightly coupled, requires a lot of tight documentation, and typically just uses Git and Post. And then you have REST, which has all these great advantages, but it's stateless, which can be good or bad, and also more difficult for developers to use. And if you say, this is great, we're going to go with REST, we're going to use REST, REST is the way we want to go, do you understand the REST constraints? Do you understand what it means to be client-server and that each must be able to evolve independently of the other? Do you know what it means to be stateless? That you cannot control or store state on the server side of your API. Are you providing cache mechanisms to the users to say, this can be cached, this cannot be cached, so essentially your cache control or your e-tags? Are you providing an interface or uniform contact? Are you using a layered system, which is kind of what we're talking about with microservices? And what about this whole thing called code on demand? Are we considering those? The reality is most REST APIs are not RESTful, and that's OK. But again, that's why it's important to understand what type of API you're using so you don't create an API and start changing it halfway through. And people say, well, no, no, we'd never do that. I actually know of a very large company where they started building the API and started making a lot of mistakes early on because they said, well, we like this, but if we pull this in, pull this in, and they started iterating, what they ended up creating was an API that nobody knew how to use because it was so far from the standards. It also means building your API for beyond today. Again, if we think about design, Roy Fielding says it best, people are fairly good at short-term design, but usually awful at long-term design. We can think about that code right now, but the second we have to extend it 15 times, a little more of a challenge. And versioning is what I like to call a necessary evil. Versioning doesn't solve problems, it creates problems. It creates backward incompatibility. So where all of a sudden you have that alarm clock that, or that burglar alarm, excuse me, that can't connect and notify emergency services. Now you have multiple services to maintain. You have multiple systems to support. It creates confusion among developers, and developer adoption is nearly impossible. And every time people say we're gonna version our API and we're gonna force all of our users to upgrade to version two, it never ever works. Was at Constant Contact, I had the privilege of being their uh, developer evangelist, and I came right as we launched version two. And the year I was at Constant Contact, I got four people to upgrade to version two. The other challenge I had is one day I got a call, and the developer was saying, hey, I'm having problems with your API, I can't use it. I was like, okay, no problem. Which version of the API are you using? And he goes, well, um, yours. Okay. Well, can you tell me how the API works? Yes, I make a post request and I get data back. Okay. Uh, do you get JSON or XML? Yeah, I believe we get one of those. And it took me about 30 minutes to figure out which version of the API this individual was on. And what happened was he got called in because the other developer was sick, had to take over this project and just knew it wasn't working. What else happened was they had just upgraded from version one to version two one of my four users. And the endpoint they needed was only available in version one and had not yet been added to version two. They were not very happy. So when to version? You do need to version when you have backwards incompatible platform changes. You're running a company called Pied Piper and your uh, data algorithm and all of a sudden you're at chat and all of a sudden you're gonna make a new internet. It probably doesn't make sense to have the same API for chat as it does for new internet your API is no longer extendable. In other words, we messed up. We hit that point. Or you're using SOAP and you want to offer a new spec such as REST. But you should not version just because you've added new endpoints or you've added new data or you've changed technologies, went from Java to Ruby. That should all be transparent and behind the scenes. You should be able to change your application services and go from Twilio to Nexmo or vice versa without anybody having any impact or knowing. Versioning does not excuse poor design. And again, a poorly designed API is going to cost you significantly more in the long run than the short run. One of the stories I'm not proud of is I had got uh, brought on to contract to build an API, and we spent six months, and we built this beautiful API. I mean, it was perfect. The code was amazing, I know, because I wrote it. Um, 
People laugh out there, apparently. Um, you know, it followed all the REST standards, great API, and we loosed it into the wild, and we realized nobody was using it. Just didn't meet their needs. So we spent the next two months trying to tweak this API, trying to fix it, and it still didn't meet their needs. We kept scrapping nine months of work because we tried to build something that we didn't test, we didn't work with the users the right way, and I'm building something that they didn't need. So we're going to have something that's called spec-driven development, which changes the way we build APIs. And that's you're going to find your API before coding. You're going to implement code reuse and design patterns so that the API remains persistent and consistent throughout. You're actually mock the API and get user feedback, make the necessary changes, then start going to the specification. And the key thing here is do not deviate. So if you think about it, it's really two stages. The first stage is you have your design iteration. The second stage is we're now going to develop based on that design. So what does it look like? Start off with, we're going to design our API. We're going to mock it out, actually test it. Once we've tested it, we can collect feedback, validate if it's ready to use or not. If it's ready, start development. The other great thing, by the way, about creating this prototype early on is if you have a mobile application that needs to be out right away, we actually do parallel development based on that prototype. So your mobile team can start building on the API even before the API itself is finished. So the goal here is that if we do this, if we can prototype, we can start bringing in things like agile user testing. And we can discover the issues with the API before we publish it. And we can let our developers do what developers do best, develop fearlessly. So sounds good. Problem is that up until now, it didn't really cost you to build an MVC, build this all out. Good news is, today there are tools that make it extremely easy to design your API, prototype your API, document it, create SDKs or client libraries, and drive user interaction. So, you know, great point made earlier, no documentation stays up to sync. Well, it does if it's derived from the source of truth, which could be the specification. Specifications out there, you have RAML, you have Mastery's IO docs, Swagger API Blueprint. Uh, with these specifications, the one I'd highly recommend, whether it be RAM or Swagger. Mastery is kind of moving away from their IO docs. Swagger is really kind of taking control and winning the battle overall. But for myself, I actually like RAML. I like RAML because you can define your API in just a few lines of code. You can see what it'll look like as you go. So as you create these resources and these methods, you can actually see what your API will look like. You can quickly prototype it for developers to try. If they need to make tweaks or changes, you're simply changing a couple lines of text, not code. Uh, you can easily document your API. The last API I built, it took me five minutes to document the entire thing. I literally installed an open source PHP script and had 15 pages of documentation. Let developers try your API online, let them interact. And then again, using services like API Mac.io uh, or REST United, you can actually generate the SDKs. So here's the challenge part. Everybody study before this session, right? You guys got the homework? No. OK. Well, we're going to do our best here uh, as we look at the, the RAML here. How many people, let me ask this, how would I create a description in RAML? Like, what would be the tag I'd use for description? Anybody? I have a laser pointer, so I can't help people cheat. So if I want to add a description to my collection here, what would I uh, type? Des yeah, description. Yep. Same thing, so as you look at RAML API Designer, kind of what it looks like, again, as we write this out, you can see exactly everything on the right. And again, here's another example of the code. To create a resource called playlist, slash playlist, method get, get, responses, et cetera. The important thing to remember here is that it's not a one and done. Uh, as you implement this, you want the spec to become the source of truth. You want it to be the source that you can use again and again. When you make changes, you can then update the specification generate your test-driven test for trust and development, excuse me, your unit test, take that, have them develop to the test, then all of a sudden you have your documentation, you have your SDKs, everything stays in line and up to date. Last but not least, make sure you incorporate best practices. Uh, with the best practices, you want to do things like use nouns, take advantage of CRUD, use hypermedia, accept content type, return header codes, and use descriptive error messages. Using nouns. With nouns, big thing here is you want to use users, not create user, get user, delete user. But you also want to use the plural. So if you're saying, look, they have an address, but in the future they might have multiple addresses, start off with addresses so you don't have to rename it later. Utilize CRUD. Uh, I think everybody here knows the create, read, update, delete. 
post git, put patch and delete. The important thing here is to understand what's the difference between post versus put, because both can be used to create new items. Uh, typically, you should not be using put to create an item, even if it has an explicit ID. Uh, what's the difference between put and patch? Put, of course, being a complete override or update, patch being a partial or update. But do you understand the differences as you incorporate and make them use them correctly? Using hypermedia. How many people here are familiar with hypermedia? People? How many people here have ever used hypermedia? No, okay. How many people here have ever used something called the World Wide Web? Just three people, four people. Okay, I'm in the wrong session here. If you've used the web, you've used something called HTML, which is the hypertext markup language. Hypermedia extends hypertext. All hypermedia is is a series of links. And to make this easy, there are numerous specifications out there. So you have HAL, you have JSON-LD, or linking definition, JSON API. Uh, my recommendation we use HAL or JSON API. But here's all hypermedia is. What it says is, OK, I made a call. Here's the URL to follow up on that. So if I want to send those messages, here's how I send a message. Now, here's the great thing about hypermedia. Let's say we have a user, and we have this messages, and people start spamming users. Somebody accidentally put a loop in, just ran through, sent 100 emails. So we say, you know what? We want to introduce a token that's unique to that link. So every time they send an email, different token. We can update that in the hypermedia without breaking anything. There's no backwards and compatibility breaks. They get the URL from the message. They can then email them. Use accepting content type headers. Uh, this is one of the common errors that we see with APIs. People say, well, I'm only going to support JSON. And you can say you're only going to support JSON until you have that million dollar customer who comes in and says, this is great. We'll sign the contract, but we need XML. Or there's a new specification that comes along, which means you can refactor your code or build it in to start with. Use response codes. Uh, this was mentioned earlier. Uh, make sure you tell people what actually happened. Use the correct response codes. 200, it was OK or updated. 201 was created. Uh, forbidden, unauthorized. 500, we obviously no idea what happened. Or you can get a little bit creative and say, we want to use 418 on my teapot, or 420, enhance your calm, which honestly, I don't get that one. Again, use descriptive error messages, which I went through. Important thing there, message, but then also link. And of course, take advantage of formats already out there. Last but not least, documentation, documentation, documentation. Keep your documentation in sync. I cannot tell you the number of enterprises I've gone to, or companies I've gone to, and we've talked, and, and they said, we need a new API. Why? It's broken. It doesn't work. When we look at the documentation, the question becomes, is the API broken, or is the documentation broken? And all they're saying is, it's broken, it doesn't work, we don't care, we'll replace it. Make sure your documentation stays up to sync. So again, as you do this, go with a long-term mindset, understand what you're building, utilize spectrum development, incorporate best practices. Um, I can't stress enough, it only takes one little thing to break your API. Remember, building an API is actually really, really easy. We have frameworks out there, super easy to do. Designing an API is hard. With that, I'm going to finally shut up uh, and stop talking, <laughs> which is a first for me. Uh, you can download my book for free online at mulesoft.com. Follow me there. Shameless company plug. And that's it. I'm getting off the stage. Thank you very much, Mike.